Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Hi there. This is Chris Gregory speaking, and this is Bob Dylan, A Head Full of Ideas, Season 3. And this is episode number 18, and this is called Sarah, Forgive Me My Unworthiness. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Bob Dylan's um, song, Sarah, which appears on the Desire album. Bob Dylan has written many love songs in his career. Uh, a lot of these, like Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, One of Us Must Know, adopt a resigned or philosophical approach to a failed relationship. Some, like Girl from the North Country or Boots of Spanish Leather, take a more romantic, if distanced, approach. A few, like It Ain't Me Babe or Just Like a Woman, are songs of rejection. During his years of domestic retreat, Dylan composed many straightforward songs of devotion, like The Man in Me, If Not For You, and Lay Lady Lay. Because of his considerable fame and his consequent, if highly reluctant, status as a celebrity, many commentators have sought to link particular songs to his known relationships. So we are told that Girl from the North Country is about Echo Hellstrom, his teenage old flame. Boots of Spanish Leather is about his early 60s girlfriend Susie Rotolo, and any number of his songs of 1964 to 66 are said to be about either Joan Byers or Sarah Lowndes, who he secretly married in November 1965. Dylan, uh, who guards his private life very carefully and never likes his songs to be pinned down to particular meanings, has always steadfastly avoided admitting that any of his songs are written for particular individuals. Even the song cycle Blood on the Tracks, although composed at the time when his marriage to Sarah was clearly in trouble, cloaks his messages in ambiguity. In Chronicles, he claims, rather dubiously, um, that the album was not about his marriage at all, but based on a collection of Chekhov's short stories. Well, that's the kind of thing that Dylan says in interviews, isn't it, really? Trying to get, the, um, trying to get us off track and um, trying to stop us tying things down too much to a particular um, autobiographical meaning. Uh, it's hardly surprising that an artist like Dylan, whose every written lyric or public pronouncement is analysed in great detail, should seek to conceal actual details of his own private life. Songs like Boots of Spanish Leather, while they may have been inspired by a particular woman, don't mention her by name and can thus be applied by listeners to their own relationships and experiences. Yet when Dylan released Sarah, the last track on 1976's Desire, for the first and only time, he appeared to be leaving listeners in no doubt as to whom the song was about. His subsequent claim in an interview that the song was addressed to the biblical Sarah, the wife of Jewish patriarch Abraham, was extremely unconvincing, to say the least. The song was, perhaps because of its intensely personal nature, never performed by Dylan after 1976. Apart from Barb Younger's jazzy take, this has also attracted very few covers. Um, those those covers have been made. A lot of them have been in Spanish or Italian language versions um, for some reason. I don't know. Go figure that one out anyway. Sarah is clearly an autobiographical song. It's a highly moving and desperate plea which focuses on the happy earlier days of a relationship when the children were very small. There's no mention of marital strife. But the song is so obviously about Dylan's own life that the lack of subterfuge or ambiguity is actually striking in itself. Desire is an album of songs that are conceived as short movies in various genres. Romance in Durango, One More Cup of Coffee and Isis are all Mexican-themed westerns. Joey is a rather mawkish mafia flick. Hurricane is a gritty anti-racist social conscience story, whereas Mozambique and Black Diamond Bay are comic tales set in exotic locations. In this context, Sarah can be seen as a highly romanticised biopic, consisting of several stylized, blissfully happy scenes from an imagined past. It's unashamedly nostalgic and sentimental, 
and is quite clearly designed to pull on the heartstrings of Dylan's estranged wife herself so that she will forgive him and come back to him. The song also differs from most of Dylan's work in that it is not difficult to interpret. The six verses consist of sepia-tinted scenes of happy occasions from the past, presented to us in the form of clear and evocative images. Each verse is followed by a variable plaintive chorus in which Bob idealises Sarah and pleads for her to return to him. Dylan enunciates with great clarity, delivering a truly passionate performance. His use of the harmonica here is especially effective. The overall tone of the song, however, is one of deep and profound sadness. In some ways, this is the saddest song Dylan, Dylan ever wrote. Um, according to uh, Dylan's biographer, Howard Saunes, Dylan actually asked Sarah to be present at the recording session when he unleashed the song for the, for the first time. The couple did reunite um, temporarily, and Sarah became part of the upcoming Rolling Thunder review playing the leading role of Clara in Ronaldo and Clara, Dylan's experimental and much malign, I've really got to say, art house film of the tour. But their reconciliation did not last, and a very messy divorce followed. Despite Dylan's heartfelt appeals to her, the prevailing mood of the song suggests that, deep down, he already knew that their marriage was doomed. Whatever transgressions he had committed, which certainly in real life included him having affairs with other women, are never outlined in any detail. The song has the air of a tragedy. The fact that Dylan, always good at keeping things vague, as Joan Byers put it in Diamonds and Rust, has actually exposed elements of his real life adds to the poignancy of the song. His tone of mournful regret makes it a genuine tearjerker. But it's not always clear that he considers himself to be responsible for the problems in the marriage. We begin with a simple but evocative description of an emotional memory. Dylan is lying on a dune at a time when the children were babies and playing on the beach. Sarah appears behind him, you were always so close, he sings, and still within reach. In the first chorus he asks her, whatever made you want to change your mind? This is of course a rhetorical question, the answer to which he is not going to supply. In a nod to Sarah's well-known interest in Zen Buddhism, which Dylan had previously paid tribute to in Love Minus Zero, No Limit, he calls her so easy to look at, so hard to define. Dylan then draws on his memory of their children playing on the beach. The descriptions are simple but highly emotive. I can still see them playing with their pails in the sand. They run to the water, they buckets to fill. Then we zoom in on for, uh, for a close-up. I can still see the shells falling out of their hands as they follow each other back up the hill. The image of the shells that the children have gathered falling back into the sand is especially affecting as if the children are already in the process of losing something but in their innocence they're basically unaware that this is happening. Dylan tries to distract Sarah from this troubling image by repeating her name over and over in the chorus, idealising her as a sweet virgin angel and a radiant jewel, mystical wife. But inevitably, it's the resonant image of the children playing, with its association with the happiness of the family that is now broken, that sticks in our minds, and perhaps Sarah's the most. In the third verse, Dylan continues to produce more evocative flashbacks, showing scenes of marital bliss. But now the images of the past come thick and fast, but are more broken up as he appears to search his memory in desperation. Sleeping in the woods by a fire in the night is followed by drinking white rum in a Portugal bar. Then we return to more sentimentalised images of the children who are playing leapfrog and hearing about Snow White before we cut to a still of Sarah in the marketplace at Savannah Lamar, a resort in Jamaica. In the live performances of the song, lines two to five are changed. You fought for my soul, he sings, and went up against the odds. This is followed by a rare piece of self-deprecation. I was too young to know you were doing it right, he tells her, before eulogising her in no uncertain terms. But you did it with strength. 
that belong to the gods. The new lines may lack the pathos of what came before, but they do supply some practical praise for Sarah, in particular for saving him from the self-destructiveness of his lifestyle, which had previously been absent. The reference to gods also credits Sarah with divine powers, a theme which will continue throughout the song. The next chorus, with the apparently rather prosaic sentiments of Sarah, Sarah, it's all so clear, I could never forget. Sarah, Sarah, loving you is one thing I could never regret, is double-edged. He admits that he will never regret loving her, but we are left wondering about so much that is unsaid here and the many regrets that he does not have the courage to own up to. The fourth verse provides the biggest shock for Dylan fans. The first line, I can still hear the sound of those Methodist bells, is highly evocative if somewhat portentous. Then we hear that I'd taken the cure and I'd just gotten through. Here Dylan appears, at least on the surface, to be being disarmingly honest about his personal life. The line suggests that he'd been a drug addict, unless he is referring to some unknown illness, possibly a sexually transmitted disease. But the image of this is somewhat buried by the next revelation. Staying up for days in the Chelsea Hotel, riding sad-eyed lady of the lowlands for you. Here and for the first and only time, Dylan refers within a song to the composition of one of his other songs, and a major one at that. All this, however, may be mere subterfuge, as according to the musicians that played on Blonde on Blonde, Sad-Eyed Lady was actually composed in the studio while Dylan was working on the album. Um, well, who do you believe? I don't know. And although that famous epic ballad contains several knowing references to Sarah, Lowlands is often thought to be a play on Lowndes, and the reference to the magazine husband does seem to refer to um, Hans Lands, her first husband, who was a journalist. It's debatable whether the song is entirely about her or whether the sad-eyed lady is a composite of all Dylan's lovers or may even refer to Dylan himself. None of this may be terribly surprising for Dylan watchers. We expect him to present a colourful and highly imagined version of his past history, as he did when he first emerged as a folk singer, claiming to have left home as a young teenager and spending several years working in travelling carnivals. In Chronicles, many of his recalled memories appear to be, to say the least, exaggerated. But in making such a statement about the composition of one of his most legendary songs, Dylan appears to be truly laying himself on the line by publicly revealing the sort of detail that normally he keeps very close to his chest. This certainly impressed Dylan's fans, although whether Sarah herself truly believed it is perhaps another matter. In the chorus that follows, Dylan reassures her that wherever we travel, we're never apart, suggesting that he's preparing for a future in which they will really be separated. Dylan continues the process of mythologization. How did I meet you, he asks. At first he tells us that, I don't know, but this is merely another rhetorical trick. He then declares proudly, a messenger sent me in a tropical storm, which sounds like he's referring to Mercury, the Roman messenger of the gods. This is followed by another idealised image of Sarah. You were there in the winter, moonlight on the snow, and on Lily Pond Lane when the weather was warm. Lily Pond Lane is, in the, uh, is the location of a beach in East Hampton on Long Island in New York State. Presumably this is the location of the beach that features in the song. Dylan now seems to be suggesting that their union was some kind of mystical process decreed by the gods. This is amplified by the beautifully alliterate first line in the next chorus. Sarah, oh Sarah, Scorpio Sphinx in a calico dress. Um, another tribute to her mystical and apparently inscrutable personality. Then, having built up his wife to a godlike status, he proceeds to deliver for the first time some kind of confession of his own responsibility for what has happened. You must forgive me, my unworthiness. After a poignant harmonica break, the final verse begins with the heartbreakingly elegiac, now the beach is deserted except for some kelp and a piece of an old ship that lies on the shore. The empty beach and the broken ship both seem to symbolise the state of their marriage. This is followed by more praise for Sarah. You always responded when I needed your help. You gave me the map and a key to your door. Sarah is further deified as a glamorous nymph, sorry, glamorous nymph, 
with an arrow and bow. This appears to be a reference to a famous painting by the 18th century Swiss artist Angelica Kaufmann, in which a nymph aims her bow at a shepherd using one of Cupid's arrows. Dylan clearly hopes that Sarah will magically revitalise their relationship by shooting one of these love arrows. It seems unlikely, however, that this will actually happen. Despite Dylan's pleas, the magic in the relationship is surely over. The song, which concludes with more plaintive harmonica, is tragic, but not uplifting. We get a very strong sense that Dylan isn't really tackling the problems in the marriage, that he's in fact avoiding them and not admitting any culpability on his own part, with the exception of his own unworthiness. The confession of which is perhaps brave, but you've got to say it's decidedly vague. It seems that the really tragic elements of what has occurred within the marriage are unspoken. Sadly, passionately, metaphysical poetry and begging for forgiveness won't wish them away. Dylan's songs are often misunderstood by those who don't grasp the fact that much of what he sings is expressed through the voice of a narrator who himself uh, may be a fictional character. So the sentiments expressed in the songs are not necessarily Dylan's own. In Sarah, a song which appears at first to, for once, put away these masks, it finally appears that he's still singing through the voice of the narrator. In this case, you might call it a fictional character called Bob Dylan, who here addresses the woman he has wronged as a goddess. In doing so, he creates the sense of hopeless longing mixed with tearful nostalgia, which gives the song its great emotional power. Okay, well, I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed that one. And um, please like and subscribe. And I'll be back with more soon. Bye. Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob?